Um... Oh, come on. Programming languages. There's a lot of them. Some are good, and some not so good. Regardless, each one allows a programmer to write code, and then turn that code into a working program. This process has always baffled me, so in order to understand how programming languages work on a deeper level, I decided that the best way to do this would be to make one myself. And so I did just that. And it was probably one of the most difficult projects that I've worked on in a long time. But I think you guys will enjoy watching the chaos unfold. So without any further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy watching my journey to create a brand new programming language. The first thing we are going to do before jumping into any coding is to brainstorm some ideas for this new language. That way I'm not going into this completely blind. And the first and most important decision I have to make is whether or not I want this language to be compiled or interpreted. In a compiled language such as C++, source code is translated into machine code, or another low-level set of instructions that could be run directly by the computer. This process, known as compilation, is typically pretty slow, but the resulting program that is generated is usually blazing fast compared to interpreted code. In an interpreted language, on the other hand, like Python, code is read line by line by a special program called an interpreter, so no compilation is necessary. This typically means that code can be written much more quickly and flexibly than in a compiled language, but it comes at the cost of some performance, or in the case of Python, a lot of performance. But since we now have an idea of the strengths and weaknesses of each language type, it's time to decide on one for our language. And the one I'm going to go with is an interpreted language. There are a variety of reasons for this choice, but the primary one is that in order to make a compiled language, you really need a good understanding of hardware level programming in order to make the compiler. And I'm not only lacking the skills required to do that, but it would also take an enormous amount of time to write a compiler for even a single architecture. So interpreted languages are the way to go. Now that we know what kind of language we will be making, I want a funny gimmick for our language to follow to make things interesting. But since I didn't have any good ideas yet, I decided to ask ChatGPT to come up with a few. And some of the ideas it came up with are freaking hilarious. Like pirate code. Introduce pirate themed syntax. Use terms like R instead of var, or X marks the spot for comments, and a vast for loops. Or how about invisible ink? Write code with invisible characters, and developers need a special decoder to reveal the actual code. This adds a layer of mystery to programming. Now, for as funny and interesting as some of these ideas are, none of them were really resonating with me, until I was finally struck by inspiration. You see, since I'm code noodles, why not make a programming language about noodles? It's a silly idea, but I really liked it. But I needed a good name for this language. And I thought of a few funny ones like spaghetti code, but I eventually settled on noodle script. It's a simple and catchy name, but more importantly, it gives me the opportunity to steal the JavaScript logo. Now that we have a good idea for what to expect with this language, it's officially time to get started. And in order to help guide me in the right direction, I found this awesome series by Tyler Laceby, I hope I said his name correctly, that goes through the general process of making an interpreted programming language from scratch. And although the series only covered a few basic language features, it was still an awesome tool to have during this project. So definitely check it out if you're interested. But enough lollygagging around, let's start programming. Right from the get-go, I made a huge mistake and that was deciding to use C++ to create this language. C++ is great for a lot of things, but definitely not this. This is because I ended up constantly doing things like manipulating strings, dealing with complex data types, and allocating memory, all things that C++ sucks at. So it would have been better to use something like Python instead, even if the performance would have been abysmal. Regardless, the first thing to create for our interpreted language, and the first thing in our interpreter pipeline, is the lexer. A lexer is a tool that takes in text and converts it into a list of symbols called tokens. This process is called tokenization, and at first glance it might seem like a simple process, since you could just make the lexer separate each word or symbol based on the spaces between them, but once you remove spaces, that logic breaks down pretty quickly. So I had to come up with a pretty robust way of determining where each token starts and stops. Here you can see an early version of this in action. This right here is some source code, and below are all of the tokens that were generated by the lexer. 
This last token with a value of EOF is the end of file token. This token is automatically placed at the end of the token list after the source code is fully tokenized. This token will become very important as we move into the next part of the interpreter, the parser. The parser is a tool that takes the tokens generated from the lexer and creates statements out of them. These statements are then organized into a complex data structure called an abstract syntax tree, or AST for short. The AST includes every feature that our language will soon support, like variable declarations, if statements, loops, and even basic functions. But just to get the ball rolling, I wanted to get some basic arithmetic working, so we can perform operations like these. But that proved to be a more difficult task than I anticipated. This is because the tokens from the lexer need to be deleted while the parser is generating statements. So I became very aware of what token was currently being analyzed by the parser. But soon I was able to get this working. Here you can see the abstract syntax tree for the source code 10 plus 5 times 2. Notice how 5 times 2 is deeper in the tree. This means that 5 times 2 would be evaluated first, before being added to 10. This is exactly what I want, since I want to keep the order of operations intact. But what's cool is that if I surround the 10 plus 5 in parentheses, the AST changes to reflect the correct evaluation order. Now this is cool and all, but it doesn't mean much if we can't run the programs we create. So it's time to start work on the centerpiece of this entire project, the interpreter. The interpreter takes the AST created by the parser and runs through each statement inside of it. And each time a statement is evaluated, it returns something called a runtime value. This is something that will allow us to add some black magic features later on. But in the meantime, I worked on writing out code to evaluate every kind of statement and expression in our language currently. And to test out our new interpreting system, I made up a terminal that we can type code into. And if I enter some basic arithmetic expressions, the interpreter outputs the result from evaluating it. Now this may not look like much, but we are now at the point where all of the core structures are now in place for us to add whatever we want to this language. And the first thing I want to add are scopes. A scope is simply a location for variables to be stored. And once it's implemented, we will be able to create our own variables whenever we want. Programming this was pretty straightforward, with the primary thing needed being a list of runtime values to represent each variable. From here, all I needed to do was to add a new statement type for variable declarations and add some new methods to the scope class to handle creating and accessing variables. Here you could see this in action. I created a variable called x and set it equal to 10. And what's cool is that if I now type the name of the variable, it is now treated just like any other value. So we can use it for arithmetic or whatever else we want. With the basics for creating variables now complete, I want to implement a special kind of variable that will be the building block for creating complex programs. The thing I am talking about are functions. Functions were a lot more difficult to create than basic variable declaration statements were, but just like our variable declarations, the first step of implementing this new feature was to create a brand new statement type to handle it. Now functions have a variety of things that we need to keep track of. Each function has a name, a list of parameters, and a body of statements. And at this point, I really wanted to start enforcing the gimmick of our language. So I switched out our old boring variable declarations with a more noodleified version. And functions are declared by typing recipe and are ended by typing eat. Corny humor aside, functions can now be created using this bizarre syntax. So if I want a function to add two numbers together, I can do so like this. And I can call the function like so. If you're wondering why there is no return statement inside of the add function, this is because I automatically return the last statement evaluated inside of the function. So no return statement is necessary. Now it's really cool that we can do this inside of the console, but this isn't going to work well if we want multi-line functions. So I created a command that can now run scripts at will, so I can use my IDE to write scripts instead, which is much more convenient. At this point, I added a bunch more features to the language, such as strings, lists, if statements, else statements, while loops, and a whole bunch of other things. But I don't want to bore you by going through how I made every feature, so instead, I decided to make a giant program that uses all of these features. And that's a program that can sort a list of numbers inputted by the user. Now, I didn't expect this to be so difficult, but it was kind of tricky to do any real debugging because my error messages are really bad. But hey, it does actually work, so even though this isn't the most convenient way to program, it gets the job done. 
just ignore this enormous and broken syntax tree. If any of you are daring enough to want to give this language a try, it will be on my GitHub, which is linked down below. And if any of you are able to create something cool with it, feel free to let me know in the comments. Anyways, thank you guys as always for watching and for your wonderful support, and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye